Greetings everybody, this is Vice to Determine speaking, and I'm going to be talking about one of the most interesting releases of 2010, which you may or may have not heard of, Watermelon's Pure Solar for the Sega Genesis, aka Mega Drive. I normally don't make video reviews for games, but for the first new Mega Drive game commemorating the 20th anniversary of the system, which was for the record back in 2008, though this wasn't released until the very end of 2010, uh, I imagine most everybody received it after Christmas. I'm willing to make an exception. I'm also doing it because people want more comprehensive footage for the game and I didn't want to rush out a video for this game, so between the, my two jobs, I spent a little time each day playing this game for the past few weeks until I completed it a few times and you'll be able to see more than just a box, which is great. You'll also be able to see what the game is like in good detail and maybe get a kick out of this while we're at it. And I know a lot of people probably didn't even expect me to have this game. I know there's probably some people out there going on like, Oh no, I can't believe this guy has this game. <laughs> but anyway, before we get this started, you need to know that I'm going to give my honest opinion and be objective. It won't affect the sales of the game, as I imagine almost everybody picking this game up as a collector in some fashion anyway. And a lot of people ask for an honest opinion or an unbiased viewpoint, but I don't think a lot of people actually mean it. Speaking of unbiased, I can't say that I'm going to be unbiased because, well, as long as it's an opinion, there's almost always going to be a certain amount of bias, or it would probably be a fact, and this game was kind of designed with a certain degree of bias, so let's not get carried away. What I can do is base the game on what I know from years of experience with role-playing games and video games in general, and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. There's already enough of that going around, so you don't need me to say it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You'll have to look someplace else. And I'm not the most lenient person around. Now, Pure Solar is the amalgamation of over half a decade of ideas, concepts, blood, sweat, and I'm willing to bet some tears, too. It started out as a novel concept back in 2004, which was intended to be a simple Sega slash Mega CD minigame, going under the tentative title of Tavern RPG until it eventually evolved into a full-scale project, going under the title of Pure Solar and drawing inspiration from some of the Sega community's favorite, greatest games as well as other RPGs, the game kept becoming more and more ambitious over the years. They were adding multiple languages, sprucing up the visuals, adding both FM and PCM audio, as well as the ingenious idea to use the Genesis and Sega CD simultaneously to deliver ambient music and sounds, and even going as far as to construct the first ever 64 meg cartridge for the system, an accolade that can't even go to the system's fiercest rival of the 16-bit era, the SNES, Super Nintendo, or Super Famicom for those that are Japanese. However, there were a lot of problems along the way too. The team encountered numerous personal problems, failed to meet deadline after deadline, kept details surrounding the game relatively scarce, and ultimately didn't finish everything as planned, but the game was eventually completed, which is a feat in and of itself, given that it's a fairly small development staff and an independent group. Pure Solar, or Solar, or however you wish to pronounce it, stems around the legends of gods and men, the desire to create a new world, to explore infinite possibilities, and the architects who possess the knowledge and ability to manipulate all creation as they saw fit. All of the ideals of mankind manifested itself into the creation of Project Pure Solar, the final chapter in a tale that began with a man's writing of Genesis. If there's one thing the architects of old knew, however, it was that absolute power corrupts absolutely. All the ideology behind Pure Solar was too much for mortal men to handle and was eventually erased, with the architects disappearing without a trace. Centuries have passed and all memory became legend, with most completely unaware of Pure Solar's existence. That's generally what the story is in the manual. I spiced it up a little bit and summarized it, kind of, but that's generally what it's alluding to in the manual. 
The story begins with Hostin, the botanist, the main protagonist of the story, struggling to find a cure for his father's seemingly incurable illness, and he thinks he may be able to retrieve a rare herb from a dangerous cave near town that may do the trick. As he ponders what to do, he runs into two of his best friends, Elena and Odessit. I have no idea how exactly you're supposed to pronounce those names, but that's how I'm pronouncing it. And anyway, they decide to help him save his father, which sets the stage for the adventure as you soon, questionably and sometimes even awkwardly, dig up relics of the past, learn about a variety of characters, and travel from one dangerous land to the next as the plot thickens and your party have trouble determining who is friend or foe on their quest. Now, the game didn't have a ton of publicity per se, but there was certainly a lot of hype surrounding the game within the small community that originally knew of it, and just from the early demo provided for the game, it was already decided by many that the game was just going to be one of the best RPGs ever. It was gonna be the game to end all games, that perfect role-playing experience that comes only once in a lifetime that would blow your socks off, and it is perfect. I kid you not, I'm not just saying it's perfect because I have it either. Oh no, it's in writing. If you don't believe me, just look at this segment right here. Yes, such humility. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with being proud of a creation or being the proud owner of a creation, but I cannot, knowing everything I know about RPGs and video games, call this a perfect RPG. Some have even compared it to titles like Final Fantasy VII and Price Gouging has already caused copies of the game to easily sell for over $300 on places like eBay. And my only response to that is, no, just... No. I would even say it's pretty far from being perfect, and of course I'm going to explain why. I'm going to show you more than enough footage and express my views well enough so you can make your own informed decision. I'll start by talking about what I feel is the weakest aspect of Pure Solar, which leads me with the story and dialogue. The story, which is usually the foundation of many great RPGs, is one of the things I probably dislike the most about this game, which I'll discuss with as few spoilers as possible. The game has a drawn-out, slow-progressing story where many justifications from going to one place to the next is as simple as we won't tell you or you don't need to know, which causes you to do some usually irrelevant thing just to get the answers that you should have gotten in the first place. While this is of course basically was the case for many RPGs back in the day, you'd expect a little bit more from a 64 meg game. There are a lot of fetch quests, forced progression, and you don't even have a clearly outlined antagonist until I'd say at least a good three-fifths through the game, and the story is very simple in its entirety with few twists or turns. I could tell you more about it, but there really isn't too much to know without outright spoiling it, but I'm obviously not going to stop here because that wouldn't be a very good summarization of the story. Now, let's put it this way, there are ancient relics, people abuse their power, history repeats itself, you stop the bad guys, the end. The whole game basically goes from A to Z without you knowing even some of the most trivial things about the characters within the pure solar universe, and you won't learn these things in the game's manual either. Speaking of the characters, and while we're at it, dialogue. Most of the cast simply either aren't that interesting or don't feel very believable, and the dialogue at times feels stiff or forced. Take Hostin's mom in the beginning of the game, for example. She appears like an everyday mom who speaks casually, is pleasant, and is generally level-headed. She scolds Hostin and swears at him for no good reason. This would be fine if she was a character known for that kind of behavior, but even with the few interactions you share with her throughout the game, you could tell it was clearly out of her character and she gives you no reason to believe otherwise. Every character in an RPG serves a certain role and there's just something certain characters should never say or do, that's just what I believe. Another example, take Elena's first encounter with Zelini, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't know. While the party is right to be suspicious, the mostly sweet Elena is uncharacteristically opposed to Zelini, much more than either the cautious host or the accommodating Odessa. 
As you analyze her a little later in the game, you get the very slight impression that she likes one of the other characters, but this wasn't illustrated at all prior to meeting Zelini, and after a certain point it's never really illustrated again, so the whole event just feels awkward in its entirety. The thing that upsets me the most is that there are several pivotal moments in this game where character relations can be opened up on not just one, but various sides. There are several camp and town moments where characters are alone and could be talking about interesting things, but seldom do. Why did Hostin become a botanist? How is Odessa a genius right out of the gate for making one barely functioning robot? Why are the Goem an outcast yet Elena is the only pointy-eared female besides the monsters in the whole game yet nobody really brings it up? Simple things like that aren't really addressed in any real detail and character depth can sometimes have more of an impact than a game's general story. Elena is probably my least favorite character in this game and really seems like she's just there to say you have to obligatory stack the elf chick, the big boob the chick. My favorite characters would be the funny man and the old guy that looks kinda like Mike from Lunar who have names but I'll omit them. Late in the game, the writing seems to get particularly strange with several oddly phrased statements, some typos such as and and which aren't coming from characters with a speech impediment keep in mind, and a general feeling of let's wrap this one up. There's even two instances where weapons are miscategorized and lead you to believe they'll poison or put an enemy to sleep, but it does it to your characters, so the dialogue can even indirectly affect the gameplay. I won't fault this game for it because it certainly isn't the first game to do so, but it's something to keep in mind and something I've observed while playing it. For a game with as much dialogue as Pure Solar has, you'd be amazed that you'll get lost fairly often in this game too, as characters often don't clearly point out where to go or what to do as they'd rather tell a joke about the SNES hardware or tell you some interesting facts or philosophical rhetoric, which is all fine and good except when clues on how to progress through the actual game are omitted. There was even one segment where one of your characters in the game, Zelini, departs with another character and nobody in the immediate area talks about it. Case in point, I had to use the game's notebook, which is meant as a more as a reminder feature, to give me an idea of what to do next. It didn't tell me how to get out of the place I was at, as you can't exit the same way you came, but it told me Zelini was at some dock back in town. How the notebook knows something that Zelini nor the NPCs knew about or clearly pointed out is anyone's guess. Overall, I'd have to say the story isn't one of Pure Solar's strong points and there weren't many highlights to it, though there are a few good references. One example of such was the reference to the, um, the 32X game Tempo, where a small rhyme is brought up by an NPC in the town of Tempo. Now moving on. So what about Pure Solar's presentation? I'd say it's also a bit of a mixed bag. In the beginning, the game just looks like a mash of undefined structures and everything appears to just bleed together and it's a bit of an eyesore. And some areas later are still a little bit like that where things are unnecessarily cluttered and where characters sometimes can't even walk around because areas are so narrow. The game doesn't really jump out at you initially, not to mention character sprites appear a bit small. During the development of Pure Solar, one of the main issues that needed to be resolved was that they needed a new graphics artist after a certain point, which I can only theorize was part of the reason, as the locales, enemy designs, and battle backgrounds get progressively better the further you go in the game. To give credit where credit is due, the game has numerous impressive, large-scale cutscenes that generally occupy the whole screen, which is very impressive and few cartridge-based games of the 8 or 16-bit era can compare in terms of quality or quantity, one that comes to mind being SFC or Super Famicom's Emmet series, and some come reasonably close, like Mega Drive's own Surging Aura. The game also has one of the most impressive looking final bosses of any Mega Drive RPG or strategy RPG, ranking up there with Shining Force's Dark Dragon and coming respectably close to the profound darkness in Fantasy Star 4. I'm also fond of the overworld, especially late in the game when you get to view it in a more dynamic sort of panoramic view, 
It's commendable effort on Mega Drive hardware, though it's no replacement for SNES's cleaner Mode 7 that could have achieved it with better results, I imagine. Many areas, particularly dungeons, are full of life, with creatures or people walking about, as well as nice environmental effects. And enemies in battle also have nice basic animations. However, when it comes to enemy variety and special effects, Pure Solar is greatly lacking. The enemies are so few in number that they color swap often, and at several points in the game, they don't even do that. The same enemies from past areas just get stronger and don't ever learn any new tricks. You'll fight some monkey or some slime or some knight, and they'll look just like prior enemies right down to their colors. But dish out more damage or reward you with more experience or money, which works, but it isn't at all exciting. The attacks in this game look relatively uninspired and recycle so many animations that it almost has to be seen to be believed. For example, there are at least three attacks that look just like Elena's Blizzard spell, which is impressive enough in and of itself, but are a different color and have sparse additional effects. And some swapped moves differentiate themselves even less than that, and one of the most disappointing moments in this game was when I learned the wind spell that looked just like the one before it, but went in reverse. Many of the attacks just lack oomph, and it's kind of a turn off to know that some of the most visually aesthetically pleasing attacks are witnessed before the first half of the game. And a final tidbit on the presentation is that there is surprisingly some flickering of the sprites during battle, even when nothing in particular is going on. I can't recall this happening in any other Mega Drive RPG, or to such an extent if it was prevalent in the first place. Well, I guess we can all say long live blast processing, but enough joking about that. Let's talk about the gameplay of Pure Solar now, as I'm sure it's one of those burning questions on a lot of people's minds, and it's something many people are probably curious about, and have been for a long time, as major gameplay footage never surfaced during the game's development. There are some good ideas in the game, but most of them are offset by awkward pacing, mandatory events which probably shouldn't have been mandatory, one-time affairs that the game should have had more of, and, most importantly, archaic design. The game possesses basic menus for equipping items, viewing stats, and adjusting in-game options, so I won't go into any real detail on the basics as I don't think it's necessary if you've ever played an RPG. Early on, the game is pretty frustrating. Enemies require a fair bit of effort to defeat and are relatively punishing, money is tight, weapons and armor are expensive and barely grant you much physical strength until near the end of the game. You need to stock up on a ridiculous amount of support items to be safe, and I mean a ridiculous amount. In an ordinary RPG, you'd think buying 20 or 30 healing herbs or potions would mean you're set to travel to the next town, but that's not the case in Pure Solar. Do not be surprised to run out of items when you buy 50 or even 100 of them, and this is just to make it to the next town. The reason you need so many is because there are a lot of awkward points in this game where you're just forced along without the ability to return to a town or sleep at an inn, and the game takes things one step further than that. There are several towns that clearly should have a rest stop that don't, or you'll rest during the story and wake up only to find that your characters are all still injured. It's a fact that you can be healed at some points during these brief stops, so why didn't they do it during some of the most annoying intervals in the game is another of life's great mysteries. The game becomes a cakewalk near the end though. The one positive is that this isn't an RPG where you'll stockpile on healing items or waste money on them because you don't use them. You will use them, so that's pretty much a non-issue. Moving along, this game has one of the most bizarre leveling and saving systems I've seen in quite some time. In the beginning, it takes quite a bit to level up, and when you do, you're not even guaranteed any noticeable stat increase. Characters have certain levels where none of their parameters will go up, not even their HP or MP, although they may have the possibility of learning a new ability. I can't tell you how much it sucks to grind for an hour, only to find that you leveled up and the character remains the same exact strength. While it doesn't affect the overall flow of the game too much, as the skills and battle strategies have more of an impact, it's just unnatural. 
Speaking of stats, some of them don't even seem to do anything, or if they do, it's so minor that it doesn't really make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. A character can excel at magic and lose just as much damage as someone who doesn't, or succumb to status ailments in the same fashion. Saving is so odd that it had to be brought up on forums and people have lost several hours of game time because of it, even though it's explained in the manual. It works like this. There are some screens you can save on from your menu. When you're in a room that you can save in, it'll say that you've saved in it, but it won't actually validate your save until you enter the next room. So you have to enter the nearest room to validate your save in the previous room, and not even at the previous position in the previous room. Does that make any sense? Does that make sense to you? Did I explain it well enough? Then you have points in the game where you'll play mini games. You know what made things like Lufia 2's Ancient Cave fun, Final Fantasy VIII's Triple Triad addicting, or Lunar Silver Star Story Complete's Lords of Lunar intriguing? Besides that they were all great diversions from the main game, they all had one important thing in common. They were all largely optional. In Pure Solar, you're required to play a Sokoban clone, a Bomberman clone, and some sliding game at some point, and you'll play it for a good little bit just to move the main story along. If you don't want to play them, tough. Sucks to be you. There is one benefit to doing it, though you can figure this out on your own if you ever intend to buy or play the game. To keep going here, the game has a lot of fairly tedious dungeons, some of which you'd think would be reserved as extra dungeons because they're so tedious, which is ironic as the two extra dungeons in the game are the easiest dungeons in the game and offer some of the greatest rewards, while many of the later dungeons reward you with pretty unhelpful things like basic herbs or stones. I originally wanted to be pretty critical of this approach, but as I was playing I actually discovered the feasible reason why this is the case. Almost every dungeon in this game isn't comprised of many smaller interconnected rooms, but a few relatively large difficult rooms to navigate through. This game doesn't so much have what I'd call random encounters, but just encounters. The reason I say this is because the game doesn't appear to have a cumulative random encounter frequency, and what I mean by that is that in most RPGs you have a certain frequency in which you encounter enemies which follows you from room to room. This doesn't appear to be the case with Pure Solar, which is proven in some of the final dungeons where you can go from room to room and not fight a single enemy. If you think you're going to fight, just walk into the nearest room and then exit and be on your way. Presto, it resets the encounter. I don't exactly know why this is the case, but that's just how it is. The biggest flaw I found with Pure Solar's gameplay, however, is that it's just unnecessarily archaic. It's not because it's a new game on a console release over two decades ago, but it's archaic even when compared to other games on the console and isn't terribly exciting. Enemies don't have drops, items can't be stolen, the game pushes you along so much, there is no convenient way to leave dungeons, and even when you gain the ability to travel freely from town to town, you can't even access all the towns you've been to previously, or you have to go through some dungeons first before you reach them. And there are plenty of examples of the time, so let's point some out. The first SFC romancing saga had many different quests, a variety of skills, and the ability to save anywhere, and it was developed in the early 90s. Next, take the NES version of Ultima Exodus. You can see enemies on the field, rob and kill villagers, hijack boats, ride horses, enter first person dungeons, and all of this was done on an 8-bit platform in the late 80s. Then you have games like Fantasy Star 2, released on the very same system as Pure Solar, made in the late 80s, which has items to reach all towns and escape dungeons, the ability to save anywhere, and a thief who can rob buildings, and the game has nowhere near 64 megs. Back in the 80s and 90s, that was pretty advanced, but by today's standards, these features just come with the territory. They may not necessarily have all these features in one game, but they're convenient in other ways. And there are a few points in Pure Solar which lead to me to believe that some of these conveniences could have been implemented, such as an ability known as Sweet Home, which returns you to a set location in the game and is a very brief skill in your arsenal anyway, or the ability to steal story-related things to progress, but it's not a part of the core gameplay. Still, there are some clear upsides to the gameplay. 
There's one point early in the game where you do a task for a hunter or a mercenary or something, I don't remember, and you get to choose his fate. And I really liked this one instance because the scene was acted out differently depending on your answer and was more than a simple yes and no affair. The tragic thing is that this is the only instance in the entire game that I can recall such a thing happening, which is just wasted potential in my opinion. The battle system itself is actually slightly original and a well presented concept. Characters have the standard options of attacking enemies either in the air or on the ground, defending against attacks, altering their position on the battlefield, and using items. However, the main draw is the addition of the gather system, which is the key to winning battles and must be mastered relatively early if you want to get to the end of this game. All the attacks get stronger the higher a character's gather is, and the more advanced attacks require a higher minimum gather just to be used. Due to the game's fairly intelligent AI, a lot of strategy comes from building gather and passing it to the other characters before they are hit, which can lower a character's gather level. The highest any individual character's gather can be is 5, and any attacks that attack an enemy that can't be reached or if you lose the required gather before attacking automatically fail. Relating to the battle system, the game has two status ailments, poison and sleep. I can't recall ever being put to sleep by a single enemy in the entire game, and the only time I've experienced it was due to a misleading item in town which has this effect on your characters at randomly. Poison, while it sounds self-explanatory, is a lot more serious than it sounds, but probably won't become a big issue except during the final boss. In addition to taking generous amounts of damage each turn, it will also lower a character's attack and defense, as well as cause confusion over time. And there's not really anything else to say about those, but given the circumstances, it's all the game really needed. So what are the best things about Pure Solar? Well, for one, the soundtrack. The soundtrack is certainly one of Pure Solar's strongest attributes. While the quality isn't the best you'll hear from a Mega Drive or Mega CD game, the composition of the tunes are excellent. The game has a diverse soundtrack that can be listened to either without a CD or enhanced with a CD, and the game features ambient sound effects throughout the various locales you'll visit. Some tunes like the Battle Theme, Ruins, Rasia theme, and Final Battle are also exceptional, and the game is almost worth it just for the soundtrack alone. The PCM version sounds soft, while the FM version sound more heavy and a little more hardcore like you're used to hearing in your Mega Drive games. The only problem with the sound, which I wouldn't even call a big deterrent, but it's something I'm bringing up anyway because I've heard so many things about it, is that many reports have surfaced with the CD skipping or not loading the audio properly when the game starts. Most cases have reported it as a combination of hardware issues as well as faults with the way the original CDs were manufactured or produced, and they were produced in China. The game also features a variety of easter eggs such as secret messages or unlocking minigames that you've played in the main game. While I personally, honestly, wouldn't really go back to any of the minigames after playing the game with the exception of maybe one of them, it's a nice thought nonetheless. The game was ambitiously translated into a variety of languages, though the Japanese language option was never finished and primarily changes menus to Japanese. It's impressive both technically and on a novel level, as I doubt most will replay this game in a secondary language, but it makes a great gift for foreign friends and it's just a nice thing to have in general. While it's also been stated at least a hundred times, possibly a thousand times, maybe even ten thousand times throughout the game's development, the packaging is exceptional for a Mega Drive game, and even compared to most games released during the 16-bit era, especially for those who received the posterity version like myself. Even if you never cared to play the game at all, the packaging is another reason to own the game, and the only title I can immediately think of from the 16-bit era that possibly tops it is the deluxe version of Fire Emblem Thracia 776 for the Super Famicom. Um, the game is a decent length, clocking in at about 25 to 30 hours on average, and the game cost a modest $50 for posterities, $35 for regular first run copies, and $45 for reprint copies, which is cheap, all things considered, especially a hell of a lot cheaper than anything you'll pay for them on eBay. 
but will seem like a heavy price to pay for a game on a decades old console. Now take it from me, given all the time, effort, and consideration that was put into making the product, it's a good deal. You won't be ripped off if you pay the prices they're asking for it on their main website should you choose to buy it. Honestly, if you compiled all of my negatives of Pure Solar without taking any of the positives into account, Pure Solar would be a pretty lopsided role-playing game with a fair number of missed opportunities, strange design choices, and it possesses a fairly flat story with many one-dimensional characters. While one could arguably call it an RPG of the 16-bit era due to the platform in which the game was released, it's also a fair statement to say that a lot of progress has been made in the past few decades that the previous Mega Drive games before Pure Solar were released, as well as any RPG on the platform. A lot of progress in general has been made in the video game industry since the days of Fantasy Star 2, Shining Force, Mado, Monogatari, etc, etc. However, my problem with Pure Solar isn't that it hardly revels in its modernization, but that Pure Solar, for better or worse, seems to ignore all the progress made within the world of video games and seems to be unnecessarily archaic, even when compared to other Mega Drive games from the late 80s and early 90s. With all the great examples of good role-playing games out there, all the great text games of clever writing and storytelling in which to draw inspiration from, and all the video games with sophisticated gameplay mechanics, Pure Solar just doesn't seem to have taken enough notes. Development staffs back then weren't like they are today, comprising a hundred members or more. An old game from the 80s having more than a couple dozen developers was a rarity in and of itself, and I can't solely excuse Pure Solar just because of the size of its team. However, Pure Solar overall is far from unplayable and was honestly a good first to try from an independent team, but it's not nearly what I call perfect. I don't think it was ever meant to be perfect. It's such a rarity for any developer to get everything right the first time. I just think that's unrealistic, and you can't brand a game as one of the finest, but not accept the potential criticism that comes with that claim. You just can't. The team is talented and deserving of our time and support, but I don't think they'll get there by merely giving a thumbs up for everything they do. I don't like using numerical scores anymore because I like people to think for themselves and not just skim through looking for the final scores. Otherwise, why would I even write a review or sit here talking to you when I can just slap down a few numbers? However, if you really want one, and I will put some notes at the end of this video, I'd give Pure Solar a 7 out of 10, with the soundtrack and professional packaging being the game's highlights. The visuals and gameplay are acceptable overall, and the story and dialogue is Pure Solar's weakest attributes. And until next time everybody, take care of yourself, support independent groups no matter how much you might love or hate them because they're doing it for us and it's a pretty nice thing to do anyway, especially if you've got the money to spare. And until next time, this is Vice to Determine, just keeping it real and doing this thing and you all take care.